What's the word, y'all? Believe it or not, the NBA regular season is just over 30 days away, and I am so very excited. I'm going to speak it into existence. The 2024-2025 season is going to be a legendary regular season and a legendary postseason, because I got to say both. Because last year, the postseason wasn't necessarily amazing. Like, I went back to rewatch some of those series, and I was like, man, in real time, this series felt better than what it was. So I need both the regular season and the postseason to be great, and it will happen. So with the season being around the corner, I wanted to basically create videos for all 30 NBA teams in no particular order. And the Knicks were the first team we landed on, which is great because the Knicks just had one of their best seasons in a very, very long time. Then they went into the offseason not being complacent with the success they had and on paper at least got better. And I've been thinking about this a lot since the Mikael Bridges trade and, and, and the Jalen Brunson extension, who what we get to. This might be the best collection of talent the Knicks have had since the 90s. Now, would they be the most successful team since the 90s? I don't really know because I guess at the end of the 90s, they had an NBA Finals appearance and everything. But I'm just looking at this team and comparing it to the other teams in Knicks history. And there's a real reason that New York is hyped right now because they have an emerging superstar in Jalen Brunson and all of the necessary role players and pieces to make this team be in top contention, which is crazy to say. But I want to take a step back. And, and talk about the offseason. Uh, but yeah, I, I cut my hair. You see it? It's over. Let's let's get used to it. Let's talk some hoops. So the critical part of the offseason for the Knicks started here when they traded for Mikael Bridges. Uh, man, salute to Woj. Um, and they gave up a lot. And you've seen it. It's Bogdanovich. It's Di Diakite. It's Shake Milton. It's a lot, a lot of draft capital. They basically went as all in as they could have for Mikael Bridges. Then they followed that up with Jalen Brunson doing something that we do not see stars across basketball doing. And he left $113 million on the table to take a smaller contract to help the flexibility for the New York Knicks. And I've talked about both of these things during the offseason, so I don't want to beat a dead horse. But of course, the Mikael Bridges thing, in my opinion, is a worthy gamble, even though you gave up all of those picks. And Jalen Brunson showing how selfless he is for a championship slash the city of New York is admirable. He, he better than me. I just say that. <laughs> he better than me. So now we're bringing in Mikel Bridges. They have one of the most feared wing defensive tandems in all of basketball. In all of basketball. With OG Ananobi, who they traded for last year around the deadline. And then Mikel Bridges. OG Ananobi like the damn DPOY in the games he played for the Knicks. And Mikel Bridges was a runner-up to DPOY just a few years ago. And I think that they complement each other perfectly. One thing that I love most about OG Ananobi's defensive game is that he scales up because he is a bigger body. So you feel comfortable with him guarding other threes and other fours across basketball and not giving up anything really. While Mikel Bridges can also guard these threes across basketball, but with his slithery frame and his freakishly long arms, he feels really good as a point of attack defender. Buzzword, buzzword. A point of attack defender. So it's just going to be extremely tough to get something going on the New York Knicks, which fits exactly what Tom Thibodeau does and the teams that he's built throughout the years. And I honestly do believe the, the year and a half experiment with Mikel Bridges being the one option in, in Brooklyn is gonna, is gonna be very important for what the New York Knicks tried to do for the next season. Before he got traded to Brooklyn, he was showcasing some of this stuff um, in that last year in Phoenix, where I think he was averaging around 18, 19 points per game. Well, he started to put the ball in the full a little bit more while early in his career, he was like, I'm gonna sit in this corner, I'm gonna defend well. I'm gonna sit in this corner, I'm gonna defend well. I think that he gained enough reps over the last couple seasons to feel like you can feel okay with calling Mikel Bridges' number to create for himself or create for others. And that was something that I don't know if he would be able to do if it wasn't for the experience in Brooklyn. I mean, you're not going to ask for it a ton in New York, but just to have it in your back pocket is going to be important for this team. But even with Jalen Brunson getting that contract, OJ Anobi getting his contract, Mikael Bridges getting traded for, there's a huge hole in the New York Knicks. And that is one of my biggest fears for them. And that is that center position. They lost Isaiah Hardenstein. Uh, to Oklahoma City because there was just too much money for him to pass up on even though he loves New York City that amount of money when you get when you think about him being on this team and that team and that team as a backup to get that amount of guaranteed money he had to do what he had to do and that leaves New York Knicks with Mitchell Robinson and Preston Chuya being their centers and Mitchell Robinson's obviously a really good basketball player he's one of the best offensive rebounders we have in the game he's one of the better defenders we have in the game but the problem is he doesn't stay healthy very long. Last year, just playing 31 games. The year before that, 59. The year before that, 72. If you get 72 from him this season, you feel great. But the year before that, just 31. That's why I get for filming videos while sitting in Discord. Hold on. So there's a huge question mark 
about whether or not Mitchell Robinson can have a successful and healthy season. Because when he's hooping, there's not much you can say about him. He actually fits the scene very, very well. But can we get him to play enough games? And if it's not him, what is the solution? Because historically, Tom Thibodeau teams do not do small ball. I watched it here in Chicago, I watched it in Minnesota, and I watched it with the New York Knicks. Now, this is a stat by Wes Goldberg, shout out to him. Um, Tom Thibodeau played just 32 possessions without a traditional center on the court all of last season. Just 32 possessions. 82 game season plus the playoffs, just 32 possessions. Just not really the Tom Thibodeau weight. But I do believe that this is going to have to be a year where Tom Thibodeau gets out of his comfort zone and allows the team to play a little bit smaller because of a Mitchell Robinson health scare or because of they just have some insane amount of depth. We talked about OG Ananobi and his, his ability to, to size up positionally defense when you talk about the defense side of the ball, guarding threes, guarding fours. We saw him guard some fives in the postseason. I'm not saying that you play full games with Julius Randle and OG Ananobi as your 4-5, but that should be a look we see way more than just the 32 possessions we got in the regular season, the postseason of last year. Because Julius Randle is a question mark for the New York Knicks. I, I don't think anybody would shy away from that. Uh, they went on that big run at the end of last season without him, and they went to the postseason. And I felt like, I mean, maybe this is not really true, but it felt like they found a new identity outside of Julius Randle. But even with that said, I, I now feel like Julius Randle is now an underrated NBA player based on the way people are talking about him. They got to ship him away for pretty much nothing because he changes the team chemistry. I don't feel that way. Like, yes, Julius Randle has had times in his career where his body language has been terrible, where he looked like he's throwing a fit. Um, Tom Thibodeau said in an interview just a couple days ago that he's 100% certain that Julius Randle is ready to adapt his game to whatever the team needs. Needs. And I honestly feel like that is true. Julius Randle, throughout the last couple years of his career, has made an all NBA appearance with little to no spacing. And now you're trying to tell me that we could potentially run some lineups of Jalen Brunson, Dante DiVincenzo, um, OG Ananobi, Mikel Bridges, and, and him, Julius Randle? That's all the spacing in the world. And everybody knows he's a bowling ball that you cannot stay in front of. I like him on this team. And when I watched them last year, when they when they uh, flirted out in the playoffs, whether due be, to the injuries or whatever, whatever, they needed another creator because Jalen Brunson, as great as he is, he's just he just needed some more help. And Julius Randle could have been that help, even though we know in the playoffs he has not been good throughout his career just yet. Because as much as I talked about Mikel Bridges getting those reps as a ball handler, um, this team could use some more self-creation. And Julius Randle provides that because you don't expect that much from OG Ananobi or pretty much anybody else in the roster. Not saying they cannot do it, but it's just not necessarily in their role, in their DNA. And Julius Randle is a guy that you can give the ball to, call his number. He can create for himself or create for others. He's a 20, 10, and 5 guy, and he has been for some time now. And now you're asking him to come in and, and eventually play with the amount of space that could be available to him, I think this is going to be a really good season for him. But on the flip side of that, I wouldn't be surprised if they did shop him around just a little bit because he's up for a contract extension. And given the fact that they gave uh, Jalen Brunson his money, I'm assuming they would probably prioritize Mikhail Bridges over Julius Randle strictly based off fit. They already gave OG Ananobi his money. I could see a world where Julius Randle is traded, but I'm going to take the roster at face value and say that Julius Randle does fit here, and I do believe he'll be malleable enough to be an impactful NBA player with the rest of the new additions to the team. And I just think about the depth, the depth, the depth of this team. It's one of the deepest. Let, let's pull up the, the depth chart. Now, especially if you look past that five position, which we talked about not having a lot of depth, the rest of these positions are deep as ever, man. And that depth obviously is extremely important when you start to think about everybody's not going to play all 82 games and be healthy throughout the course of this year. So you know what the potential starting lineup is. But like um, Deuce McBride, it got to the point once they made all of the trades and they sent Emmanuel quickly over to Toronto, well, Deuce McBride got a part of that rotation. There were games where he played full 48 minutes. Tom Thibodeau, don't do that again. But he, that's how much he was trusted by Tom Thibodeau and he played well. Once we got to the postseason, he made some really big shots down the stretch. He was closing out specific games. The game that Tyrese Maxey hit that four-point play to continue the series or whatever, Deuce McBride is on the court there when Mitchell Robinson fouled him. That is last minute of a big playoff game. That's how much trust Tom Thibodeau had in him. We go back to Adante DiVincenzo just had the best year of his career when he was one of the best three-point shooters in basketball. Josh Hart got to the Knicks and turned into, I don't, I don't know, Dennis Rodman light where you can have a game where he takes gets 15 boards. 
Like this team has a lot. And Preston Chuya is also a quality, quality piece. And not to mention they brought in a guy like Cameron Payne to be that third string point guard. They had Bates Diop in the trade. And I've, I've been a Kade Bates Diop guy for a few years. I may have to sell my stock. Maybe this is the last year of it. But they have guys. And even the rookie Tyler Kolek looked really, really good once they got to Summer League. And I don't expect them to play much, but like they have depth on depth on depth, which is important. In this league, but I got a little ahead of myself. I want to talk, go back a little bit to the center position and talk about how important it is that they either find a center, um, even if that is a Julius Randle trade, or just trust the fact that they're going to run um, a small ball lineup with Julius Randle at the five. Because last year in the regular season, and I'm, I'm going to put all these minutes with Jalen Brunson because he is the dude. When Jalen Brunson was on the court, with Mitchell Robinson last year, they had a net rating of 1.33, which is not ideal, right? 1.33 is not amazing. When Jalen Brunson was on the court without Mitchell Robinson, it was a plus 15. And you're like, Kenny, where did that plus 15 come from? Well, it was when Isaiah Hardenstein was on the court. Um, and Isaiah Hardenstein was extremely, extremely important. It's going to be, I don't I want to say impossible, but extremely difficult to fill those shoes. Like, I want y'all to internalize how in 1,300 minutes, this team, when they had Ihart and Jalen Brunson on the court together, had a defensive rating of a 111. 111. That is ridiculous. And about a same amount of minutes with it was just Jalen Brunson and no Isaiah Harden now. So this could be Pressure Chuya. This could be, again, Mitch Robinson. They were just above a one net rating. That's the type of minutes and production and impact you're trying to replace on a night in, night out basis. And if you listen to my podcast, which is coming back, by the way, the Kenny Beachum Podcast is no longer called the Kenny Beachum Podcast. I changed the name and I'm excited to announce that in a few weeks. Um, if you watch that earlier, after the OG Ananobi trade, one thing I said on my podcast is that the, the New York Knicks are about to be this case study and the ability to win games and playoff series without a superstar. Will, will Jalen Brunson has come as close to a superstar as you can imagine? Yeah, some of y'all probably have him as a superstar, and I'm not even mad at the idea. Only reason I wouldn't put him in that tier just yet, because I feel like you have to do it for multiple, multiple seasons, but he is as close to that as possible. We have multiple 40-point games in a row in the NBA playoffs. He had the highest usage rating of anybody in basketball the second half of the season, and then rolled that momentum to be dominant in the playoffs. So the idea of them being the best constructed team without a superstar might not be the case anymore because Jalen Brunson might be that guy. But the one thing that makes this team unique, once we get to the playoffs, right, a lot of the times it's the team that has the best player in the series is the one that's going to win. Hell, you look back on the NBA Finals of last, where it was the Dallas Mavericks and the Boston Celtics. In my mind, it was no question that the Celtics were the better team and the team that would win that series. If you go look at the experts' prediction, a lot of them picked the Dallas Mavericks. And it's not because they thought the Dallas Mavericks were a better constructed team than the Boston Celtics. It's because they had the best player in Luka Doncic. So you see that seven-game series. If I have a Giannis, I have a Braun, I have a, a Jokic, I have a, a Luka, I usually see that team win the series, especially if the role players are not that much different. Well, the Knicks are on different territory. We're in the in the Eastern Conference. They might go through multiple series without having the best player, and I still feel good about their chances of winning. If they go against the Bucks in the playoffs, they don't have the best player in this series. If they go against the 76ers in this series, assuming health, they don't have the best player in this series. They don't have the best player in a lot of, against a lot of these teams. The, the, the Tatum versus Jalen Brunson conversation. I've seen it on Twitter a few times. I don't have a take. But if, if they were to go against some of these teams, I feel confident that they can go out there and make it a series and even win that series without them having the overwhelming favorite player. And I think that speaks to the depth. I think that speaks to the coaching. And I think that speaks to the guy that we talk about in Jalen Brunson being that electric. His ability to get to the playoffs and up his free throw um, attempts is stellar. And I know some people don't like free throw attempts. In my personal opinion, I think it's extremely important for a star player to get to those free throws and hit those free throws because they're easy points, especially come postseason. I think the league is evolving, especially now that we've seen, what, five champions in five different years. Is this six now? Six champions in six different years? Almost anything is possible. And that wasn't necessarily the case 10 years ago. Where again, you needed a Braun, you needed a Curry, you needed a Durant in order to really be in contention. This team can be an outlier and make some things happen. I don't know exactly where I project them to be. Again, they were a 50-win team last year. Uh, in the regular season, I expect them to win 50 to more again. But come postseason, again, I don't, I don't know if they match up against the Celtics, how I feel about that, or they match up against the new-looking 76ers, how I feel about that. I think I'm going to have to see these teams actually on the court before I start doing that. But nonetheless, this is an extremely exciting Knicks team, maybe the best Knicks team of my life. 
and I'm excited to see where they go from here. Because I do believe that some people look back on that Mikel Bridges trade and think about how much they gave up in draft capital and think that that was the end all move, that they don't have any wiggle room now that they gave up all those picks. And I don't think, I, I think that's very far from the truth. And I'm not saying that they're about to be big players again and go get an all-star at the trade deadline, but I do believe they still do have some pieces if they wanted to upgrade different parts of this roster. And that may be one of the reasons why they haven't went out to get a center just yet, uh, because they're waiting to see what they have with potentially running a small ball lineup or seeing if Precious Achulia can look better this year than last year, seeing if Mitchell Robinson can stay healthy. So there are a lot of ifs and a lot of things, but that's why we love the offseason, man. They made some big decisions, some big moves, and I'm excited to see what the Knicks end up doing.